So it's 4 p.m. Let's get started. So welcome everyone to this um, last session of our iScan 2021. And uh, we're going to now switch gears again and, and move more to the human and clinical side of things. And we have four very exciting speakers for this session. And we're going to start right away with Jan Laxo from Prague. Um, Jan is a neurologist and who has done a lot of uh, very important work on navigation in, in the particular various stages of, of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, today he's going to talk about the role of base of the base to forebrain in spatial cognition. So over to you, Jan. Uh, thank you very much for a nice invitation and uh, good afternoon, your colleagues. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to give a lecture at the third ISCAN symposium organized by professors Thomas Wolbers and Motohar Yoshida. I have uh, nothing to disclose. So in my talk, I am going to briefly provide you with anatomy and projections of the basal forebrain, explain the role of the basal forebrain in um, Alzheimer's disease, and show how morphometry changes of the basal forebrain and its projections are associated with alterations of spatial navigation across the AD continuum and alterations of spatial pattern separation uh, in AD. The basal forebrain is uh, located in the frontal lobe, ventrally from the striatum. It consists of five nuclei, including the medial septum, labeled as CH1 in the Mesulam's classification, vertical limb of the diagonal uh, band of a broca, labeled as CH2, and these two nuclei are mostly measured together. Then there is a horizontal limb, limb of the diagonal band of broca, labeled as CH3, nucleus basalis of minor, labeled as CH4, that consists of three regions, enter, intermediate, and posterior. And the last is uh, nucleus uh, superterminalis. Uh, the uh, basal forebrain uh, neurons are the main source of uh, cholinergic uh, projections uh, to the cerebral cortex. The CH1 and the CH2 nuclei primarily uh, project to the hippocampus and the uh, entorhinal cortex. The CH3 uh, nucleus uh, primarily project to the olfactory bulb, and uh, the CH4 uh, primarily uh, projects uh, to the cerebral cortex. Uh, the CH4 uh, nucleus basalis of minor uh, projects to a different uh, cortical areas, depending on which region of the nucleus the projections come from. The anterior region uh, projects to the medial hemispheres, to the frontal, parietal, and occipital cortex, and also to the amygdala. The intermediate region projects to the lateral hemispheres, to the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal cortex. And finally, the posterior region projects to the temporal pore, perirhinal cortex, parahippocampal cortex, and the supertemporal gyrus. It is well known that cholinergic dysfunction is a typical hallmark of AD. And more than 20 years, cholinesterase inhibitors are used as a symptomatic treatment of AD. Cholinergic deficit in AD is caused by degeneration of the basal forebrain, which is the first region together with the transentrinal cortex and the locus cerulose, where the tau pathology is found. The findings from autopsy studies are supported by clinical studies, showing that the basal forebrain degeneration precedes the generation into entorhinal cortex and is found in preclinical AD. That is, it is more pronounced in the cognitively normal order adults with uh, amyl abnormal amyloid beta in cerebral spinal fluid compared to those with normal CSF amyloid beta. Atrophy of the basal forebrain also predicted the degeneration in the entorhinal cortex across the AD continuum ranging from preclinical to dementia stages, but not the other way around. In fact, the basal forebrain and the entorhinal cortex predicted the distinct patterns of downstream degenerative spreading. Specifically, basal forebrain atrophy predicted degeneration in the entorhinal cortex, whereas entorhinal cortex atrophy predicted the degeneration in the temporal 
and the parietal cortex. Atrophy. Uh, atrophy of the uh, base, atrophy of the basal uh, forebrain. Sorry for that. Oh, perfect. Atrophy of the basal forebrain, especially CH4 posterior region, was also associated with a reduced cortical glucose metabolism in the precunose in older adults at risk for preclinical AD. And finally, basal forebrain atrophy was associated with a regional amyloid deposition in several cortical areas, including the precunus, posterior cingulate, prefrontal cortex, inferior and middle temporal gyri, and the temporal parietal junction in preclinical and early clinical AD. Animal studies suggested that selective lesions of basal forebrain cholinergic neurons lead to impaired spatial navigation in Morris water mix. Lesioned mice took longer to reach the hidden platform on training trials, and worse spatial navigation performance on the probe trial was associated with a lower hippocampal choline acetyltransferase activity. Also, selective lesions of basal forebrain cholinergic neurons lead to impaired place avoidance in an arena with a no intra and extra maze cues, where animals had to rely on self motion cues. Lesion uh, rats that received murine uh, separin had worse performance compared to animals that did not undergo surgery or uh, received rabbit separin and were similar to animals that did not receive uh, food shock during training. Specifically, lesioned mice had more entrances to the shock zone and explored further from the home the safe zone compared to control animals that received food shock during training. Acetylcholine plays an important role in spatial navigation in animals and humans. And our recent translational study showed that administration of scopolamine a centrally active anticholinergic drug impairs allocentric navigation in rats and humans, while co-administration of acetylcholinesterase inhibitor alleviates this effect in a comparable protocols in a water maze task. It was also shown that acetylcholine increase may improve spatial navigation in patients AD. Specifically, older adults with mild AD dementia improved in allocentric navigation in a computerized human water maze task after a three months treatment with an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor donepezil at a dose of 10 mg per day. And no improvement in performance was observed in the non-treated group. The first study exploring the association between basal forebrain atrophy and spatial navigation in AD used the real space and computerized versions of the human Morris water maze task, where depending on the task, the participants could use a start position and two orientation cues to locate the goal, as in the mixed allo egocentric task, or only the start position, as in the egocentric task, or only two orientation cues, as in the allocentric task. The study showed that atrophy of the anterior basal forebrain that consisted of CH1, 2, 3, and CH4 anterior nuclei, and also atrophy of the posterior basal forebrain that consisted of CH4 intermediate and CH4 posterior nuclei, was associated with worse allocentric navigation in the real space task in cognitively normal participants, participants with amnestic mild cognitive impairment, and mild AD dementia. In our recent study, we recruited biomarker-defined participants with AD who were in amnestic mild cognitive impairment and mild dementia stages. Using the real space human water maze task and a more detailed basal forebrain mass, we showed that especially atrophy of the CH12 and the CH4 posterior nuclei is associated with worse allocentric navigation in AD. Another recent study focused on associations between basal forebrain atrophy and spatial navigation in individuals at higher risk for AD. For this purpose, 
they recruited cognitive and normal older adults with cognitive complaints. This is individuals with subjective cognitive decline who are at high risk for AD and those without complaints. Using the computerized human water maze task, they showed that atrophy of the whole basal forebrain and especially CH4 posterior nucleus is associated with the worst allocentric navigation, the whole cohort, and especially in older adults with subjective cognitive decline. In our very recent study, we recruited older adults at higher risk for AD dementia. This is individuals with subjective cognitive decline and amnestic mild cognitive impairment. Again, we used the real space of a human water maze task and showed that atrophy of the CH4 posterior, uh, CH4 anterior intermediate, and the uh, CH1 and 2 basal forebrain nuclei is associated with worse allocentric navigation. As a next step, we use structural equation modeling to evaluate complex interactions between the basal forebrain nuclei, hippocampus, entorhinal, and prefrontal cortex, and allocentric navigation. Controlling for demographic factors, we identified three pathways through which different basal forebrain nuclei influence allocentric navigation. First, CH1 to atrophy was associated with worse navigation through hippocampal atrophy. CH4 enter intermediate atrophy was associated with worse navigation through prefrontal cortex atrophy. And finally, CH4 posterior atrophy was associated with worse navigation through entorhinal cortex atrophy and subsequently hippocampal atrophy so through the hippocampal path rather than through entorhinal cortex atrophy alone, which was the non-hippocampal path. The direct associations between basal forebrain nuclei and allocentric navigation were not significant in this model. Uh, next, uh, we explored basal forebrain projection, especially cortical projections to the hippocampus and their associations with spatial navigation. The projections were reconstructed using probabilistic spectrography in cognitively normal older adults, individuals with subjective cognitive decline and mild cognitive impairment. Basal forebrain cornical projections were disrupted in older adults with mild cognitive impairment as indicated by a decrease of all diffusion tensor bed track integrity measures compared to cognitively normal older adults. Decreased track integrity measures were associated with worse allocentric navigation performance in the whole cohort. And uh, now I'll briefly talk about association between basal forebrain and uh, pattern separation. Pattern separation is a process that is crucial for effective encoding, where two similar information has to be encoded separately, allowing for subsequent accurate recall. This applies to similar objects, places, or locations, where this is called spatial pattern separation. In the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus and the CA3 subregions are essential for uh, pattern separation processes. Both regions are modulated by cholinergic septal hippocampal projections for the basal forebrain. In AD, basal forebrain degeneration leads to diminished cholinergic input that causes reduced activity of the dentate gyrus and increased activity of CA3 recurrent collaterals, which results in decreased discrimination ability and uh, pattern separation uh, deficits. Animal studies suggested that selective immunotoxic lesions of basal forebrain cholinergic septal hippocampal neurons lead to impaired spatial pattern separation. In a new environment, lesion threads did not develop a new spatial representation distinct from that of the familiar environment, which resulted in an increased similarity score, and their place cells maintained similar firing fields across different environments, indicating place cell rigidity. In our recent study, uh, we recruited biomarker-defined uh, participants uh, with AD were in an uh, amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment and uh, mild dementia stages. 
we used a spatial pattern separation task where the participants remember the location of a blue circle on a computer screen and after 20 second delay indicated which of the two simultaneously displayed circles was in the same location as the previously presented one. Four spatial separation distances between two circles were used, 0, 0 0.5, 1, and 1.5 centimeter. Our results showed that atrophy of the CH12 basal forebrain nucleus, the hippocampus, and the entorhinal cortex is associated with worse spatial pattern separation in AD. As a next step, we used a mediation analysis to evaluate interactions between the CH12 nucleus, hippocampus, and spatial pattern separation. Controlling for demographic characteristics, we identified two pathways through which CH12 nucleus influences spatial pattern separation. Specifically, CH12 atrophy was associated with the worst spatial pattern separation directly and also indirectly through hippocampal atrophy, indicating that the hippocampus partially mediates association between basal forebrain and spatial pattern separation. We also evaluated interactions between the entorhinal cortex, hippocampus, and spatial pattern separation. Controlling for demographic factors, we found that entorhinal cortex atrophy is associated with the worst spatial pattern separation only indirectly through hippocampal atrophy. The direct association between entorhinal cortex and spatial pattern separation was not significant in this model. In our latest study, we segmented the hippocampus into three functional subregions the head, body, and tail, and the entorhinal cortex into two functional subregions, anterolateral and posterior medial entorhinal cortex, and evaluated complex interactions between these subregions, CH12 nucleus, and spatial pattern separation in older adults with AD. Controlling for demographic factors, we identified two significant models. In the first model, we identified two pathways through which CH12 nucleus influences spatial pattern separation. First, CH12 atrophy was associated with the worst pattern separation through atrophy of the hippocampal tail. Second, CH12 atrophy was associated with worse pattern separation through atrophy of the posterior medial and trial cortex and subsequently atrophy of the hippocampal tail, rather than through atrophy of the posterior medial and trial cortex alone. The direct association between CH12 nucleus and spatial pattern separation was not significant in this model. In the second model, we identified one pathway through which CH12 nucleus influences spatial pattern separation. Specifically, CH12 atrophy was associated with worse pattern separation through atrophy of the posterior medial and trial cortex and subsequently atrophy of the hippocampal body, rather than through atrophy of the posterior medial and trial cortex or hippocampal body alone. The direct association between CH12 nucleus and spatial pattern separation was not significant uh, in this model. In conclusion, uh, the basal forebrain is the main source of cholinergy projections to the cerebral cortex and consists of five nuclei. It is the first region with tau pathology in AD. Basal forebrain atrophy precedes and predicts the generation of the entorhinal cortex and is associated with reduced cortical glucose metabolism and cortical amyloid deposition in AD. In animals, selective lesions of basal forebrain cholinergic neurons lead to impaired spatial navigation in Morris water maze and impaired place avoidance when using self-motion cues. The lesions also cause impairment of spatial pattern separation, manifesting as place cell rigidity. Basal forebrain atrophy is associated with impaired allocentric navigation across the AD continuum from pre-clinical AD to AD with mild cognitive impairment to AD dementia. Most evidence for this association was found for the CH12, CH4 posterior, and the CH4 inter intermediate nuclei. 
It seems the basal forebrain atrophy affects olfactory navigation indirectly through other brain regions. Specifically, the CH12 nucleus seems to affect navigation through the hippocampus. The CH4 posterior nucleus affects navigation through the entorhinal cortex and subsequently the hippocampus. And the CH4 anterointermediate nucleus affects navigation through the prefrontal cortex. Basal forebrain fornical projections uh, seem to be disrupted in older adults with mild cognitive impairment, where decreased tract integrity measures are associated with impaired allocentric navigation. Atrophy of the CH12 nucleus seems to be also associated with impaired spatial pattern separation in biomarker defined older adults with AD, where uh, CH12 atrophy affects spatial pattern separation indirectly through the hippocampal and the entorhinal cortex subregions. Specifically, it seems that CH12 nucleus affects spatial pattern separation through the hippocampal tail and through the posterior medial entorhinal cortex and subsequently the hippocampal tail. It also seems uh, that the uh, CH12 nucleus affects spatial navigation through the posterior medial entorhinal cortex and subsequently the hippocampal body. In the near future, we would like to explore the associations between basal forebrain morphometric measures and root learning and wayfinding in a virtual reality task in a biomarker defined older adults with AD. It would also be interesting to examine the associations between basal forebrain measures and path integration in cognitively normal older adults and individuals with AD. Also, longitudinal studies examining if basal forebrain volume can predict spatial navigation decline in AD could yield interesting results. And finally, it would be interesting to reconstruct all cortical basal forebrain projections and explore their associations with spatial navigation in older adults with AD. And uh, finally, I would like uh, to acknowledge my all my colleagues and collaborators and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Jan, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. That's excellent. Um, so while we are still waiting for the audience to come up with questions, maybe I can I can get started. Okay. <laughs> so um, thinking a little bit about what, what Dave Reddish just said, like trying to maybe put on this computational hat and think about what, are, what is it on the computational level that could be affected in, in those patients. I mean, we heard on day one, like from Stefan Remy about like medial septal pacemaker in terms of speed coding, so that the cholinergic uh, influence could have been something to do with speed modulation. Do you have, and I think you mentioned self-motion cues in one of your slides, so do you have any insights whether there is already something like, say, a speed perception deficit in those patients? Uh, I, I think that this definitely uh, plays a role here, but I also think uh, that this uh, modulation is uh, more complex because uh, different uh, basal forebrain uh, nuclei can uh, modulate a uh, different uh, brain region. So they uh, modulate the uh, activity of the hippocampus as in the spatial uh, separation, they can uh, increase the activity of CA3 recurrent collaterals and uh, decrease the uh, activity of uh, uh, granular cells in the dentate uh, gyrus. And uh, th this is the direct uh, pro projections uh, uh, for, from the medial septal nuclei. And uh, definitely the medial septal nuclei, uh, they influence the entorhinal cortex, they can influence the speed cells. Uh, and uh, I assume that uh, they uh, can also modulate other cells that are the uh, border cell, uh, grid cells, and uh, so on. And uh, other parts of the basal forebrain, uh, especially nucleus bazaar of a uh, minor, the uh, anterior, anterior portion, can uh, also uh, modulate the retrosplenial cortex and the precuneal that the head direction cells. Are. So I think that the story is, uh, will be is, uh, very complex and uh, is worth to explore. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Um, so I see Michael raising his hand. Hi, Michael. Oh. Hey there. Hey, Jan. Um, Hi. Hi. Um, so I just wonder, you know, cholinergic system, of course, is not 
specific for memory or spatial navigation. So many people with cholinergic deficits also have attentional and motivational deficits. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how do you think this influences your results and whether you mention attentional and motivational performance in those particip participants? Oh, uh, thank you, Michael. It's a it, it's a it's a great great question. Uh, definitely, the motivation and uh, attention plays a role in uh, all tasks, and it's uh, almost uh, uh, impossible to uh, uh, ex exclude uh, these uh, cognitive uh, domains for this uh, task. Uh, so, uh, during the administration, we uh, try to uh, focus and uh, train the participants as uh, much as uh, possible. And uh, during the training, we try to uh, assure that uh, they are uh, definitely uh, pay attention on that. Uh, so this is the first part. And the second part uh, is that uh, it, it would be only the case of uh, attention and uh, motivation. So uh, I uh, expect that the attention is uh, widely distributed through, throughout the brain, mostly in the uh, prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. And uh, this prefrontal cortex is uh, modulated uh, by, uh, by uh, CHO4. It uh, means uh, the baby, it, uh, it, it means uh, that uh, nucleus basal is of a uh, minor. So, uh, but we have also shown that the for for an example, CH uh, uh, one or two, it's a medial uh, septum and a vertical bend of a, a broca that is uh, directly associated or project uh, uh, to the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex and not uh, to the prefrontal cortex. Uh, uh, they are somehow indirectly associated with a spatial pattern of separation. So. Uh, my my answer would be uh, definitely attention and motivation would play a, a role and would uh, modulate uh, the association between the basal forebrain and the spatial uh, na navigation. But it's uh, just only a part uh, part of that. And uh, the only way how to partially disentangle is to uh, focus on uh, different uh, basal forebrain nuclei, which uh, project to the to the different to the different uh, regions. Thank you. <clears throat> so I don't see any questions from the audience. Any any other questions from the panel? So if there are no questions, just uh, I have uh, uh, two. If you are interested, just uh, uh, two, two last uh, uh, additional slides. When, when I uh, can uh, show that the basal for the atrophy uh, predict degeneration of the entorhinal cortex, but not the other way around in older adults who are cognitively normal or mildly impaired, but not only in those with uh, but only in those with positive aging biomarkers. So it seems that the atrophy of the basal forebrain predicts degeneration of the entorhinal cortex uh, specifically in uh, AD patients. And also, uh, it seems that the basal forebrain atrophy is associated uh, with a global cortical amyloid load across the AD continuum in a different ways, where the atrophy on the anterior basal forebrain is associated with cortical amyloid load in older adults with AD with mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Whereas atrophy of the posterior basal forebrain is associated with cortical amyloid load in older adults with preclinical AD. So it seems the posterior part of the basal forebrain uh, may degenerate earlier in Alzheimer's disease than the anterior part. So, and uh, it's uh, also what to worth for the exploration. Yes, then. Right. I hope you can see that. Yes, we can. Great, so next speaker in this session is going to be Michael Hornberger from the University of East Anglia and um, talking about song lines of dementia. Michael, over to you. Great, well, thank you for having me. Uh, well, it's just the third eye scan, I can't believe it. And Thomas is still inviting me, so <laughs> I don't know if I have anything new to say. I hope I can present you some new things. So I gave a bit of a mysterious title, Song Lines of Dementia. Um, and the reason, first, I need to explain this title, basically, because some people might not know what I mean with that. <clears throat> so song lines, of course, I refer to the, the book, actually, Bruce Chapman wrote the song lines, and I really recommend it. This is my very old tatty <laughs> copy of that book. 
And in that, it's actually, it's not a book on spatial navigation per se, but he basically, it's a book on Australia, and he covers in this basically the song lines in Australia of the Aboriginals. And here I'll show you one of these song lines, which is the Seven Sisters song line going from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. And these were kind of navigational lines the Aboriginals would still use. And um, it's really fascinating to learn about this. But I think it's really relevant as well how dementia people find their way around in the real world. And I'll come back to this right at the end. But just to give you, and you heard already a bit about this the other day, to define dementia, I think the, the key aspect is to understand that this is really a kind of an umbrella term, dementia, under which we have uh, Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for roughly 60 to 70 percent of people with, with dementia. And that's why when most people talk about dementia, they mean Alzheimer's disease. But then you have vascular dementia, or these days is very often referred to also as vascular cognitive impairment or VCI. I'm going to talk about this as well, around another 20 to 30 people. And this can really overlap a lot with Alzheimer's disease. And then you have more the rarer forms, frontotemporal dementia, dementia by Lewy bodies, which I'm really only not really going to talk about today. Just briefly mention our frontotemporal dementia work. So let's go to Alzheimer's disease, and you've already heard so much about this, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. But one key thing to understand is that uh, Alzheimer's disease develops over a long, long time. And uh, the current theory, and this is a theory at the moment still, uh, even though the experimental data is kind of seem to be promising and showing that this is really true, shows that amyloid is the first uh, biomarker which basically goes up. So amyloid accumulates in the brain of people then emerges tau, this causes atrophy, and this causes then memory problems. And by the time people have memory problems, they usually see their doctor and get a diagnosis of what's called mild cognitive impairment. And then only once the clinical function or everyday function is affected, then they usually get a label of Alzheimer's disease. But we can see it from here to here, there can be uh, years or in some cases decades before that. And hence these days the mantra in dementia is that it's a, a disease of middle age presenting at old age, uh, which also includes me. So it's really important to understand this concept uh, that for at the moment when we see memory deficits in people, we actually look at a, a situation where all the amyloid and tau is nearly saturated in the brain already. And that's a clear problem for us. And that's why we wrote this review quite, a, so this was a PhD student of mine, uh, Gillian, uh, who wrote this review on actually looking at the overlap between the prodromal uh, dementia regions and this uh, strong overlap as well with the spatial navigation network. Of course, you have the hippocampus as well with episodic memory, but there is of course a place cells as we all know. But in particular, we've heard already a lot about entorhinal cortex. So I'm not going to go into this, but I think it's really this network of the medial uh, temporal, medial parietal regions, which is really critical for understanding Alzheimer's disease. And you've seen the beautiful data by Karen Duff. I've just showed this to you again here, where she shows in the mice uh, how these mice, when they have in particular tau, that they really have memory problems, uh, it, develop memory problems over time, and how the grid cells basically disintegrate in these mice, um, which I think uh, was for us when this came out, it was really a realization before that we did spatial navigation that this was really a, a process we should tap into. And the key process for us for Alzheimer's disease is clearly power integration. And again, we've heard a lot about this. Uh, and path integration is, of course, just the combination of the translation, which the, the grid cell network allows you, or I tell always the patients, you should compare this to your odometer in your car, how far you've moved, basically, through space. And the angular displacement, which a lot of this is the head direction cells, which we can be heard a lot about this. So combining this, the beauty of path integration, and Thomas showed this beautifully in their data, is, of course, that you can, instead of asking people to navigate necessarily back all the way, you can just ask them at the end point to actually go back to the beginning or point to the beginning. Uh, and this is a really great process to look into, which we've done over the years, many tasks. This one has become the most, I guess, commonly used. It's used across some really big studies, actually, like EPAT or PREVENT, uh, which uh, is also called a supermarket task. So sorry, cast it, um, your task. There are other supermarket tasks, of course, available. Um, 
And um, this was developed from a student again. And I always say, I wish we had it developed nicer because it looks a bit like a Soviet supermarket with half empty shelves. Um, but there we are. So what in this task is a passive viewing task. So the uh, patient just watches short video clips uh, where they come to a location and then they ask which way is the entrance, which they point to in real life. And then they get a map of the supermarket and have to indicate where they think they stopped. And um, we, did, we first looked at this in controls uh, and then two different types of frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease to show that it's really an Alzheimer disease specific deficit for the egocentric task. And that really tapped much more in this kind of posterior singlet slash retrosplenial atrophy in the patients. Um, but we saw similar deficits then for the allocentric task, where interestingly, we found that all the patients, they were much more clustered on the borders. And of course, we've heard a lot about border cells and um, that people basically, um, you know, especially mice, they use the borders to kind of refocus even though Thomas showed in his data that maybe this might not be true for older, healthy people. But we see this clearly in the patients, <clears throat> which we think is, again, an indicator of the failing GERD cell network that patients, first of all, have thought they uh, thought they moved much further than they have and that they're orientating themselves much more on the borders. But I'm not going to talk much more about this because I've covered this in other talks and people who have heard my previous talks, then they, they might be bored by this. So instead, I want to actually flip a bit to some rec more recent data where we looked at vascular cognitive impairment. And this really came from some observations um, that, first of all, vascular cognitive impairment is huge. Uh, so it's many people with Alzheimer's disease will have also vascular changes. And uh, the kind of classic pure vascular forms might be not uh, as common as we previously thought. But what do we mean by vascular cognitive impairment? And, you have to see this as a kind of continuum, I guess, uh, where on the one end, uh, you have what we would call a multi-infarct dementia. So these are people who have multiple strokes or infarcts over time. And every time they have a stroke, basically their cognition goes down until they qualify for a diagnosis of dementia. And uh, so this is the severe case. You have a very large, either just one large, very large uh, cortical stroke or uh, multiple strokes. Then you have what we call the more the strategic infarcts. This is like a classic uh, thalamic, looks anterior thalamic uh, stroke. And uh, what you can see is that people are fairly healthy. Then they have the stroke. And after that, there is some potential compensation happening, but they're still qualified for diagnosis of dementia. And then you have the third category, and these are people who have much more uh, changes, uh, in particular to the white matter, which is called white matter hyperintensities, and uh, very small infarcts, which I'm not sure you can see that, uh, they're like little holes. Um, and these are very tiny strokes these people have. And of course, uh, um, these are um, very common and very often not detected. It's very common for people who have high cholesterol or high blood pressure, which, of course, are extremely common conditions in aging. So this is one thing uh, which then very often leads to more gradual decline. And at some time, uh, some form, people will qualify for a diagnosis of dementia. The other thing is that these small kind of infarcts or white matter hyperintensities also interact with the amyloid uh, deposition. Uh, and potentially tau, even though that's still kind of not completely clear. So it, these kind of changes might drive the dementia processes further on or accelerate them. It's like, you know, putting like oil on the fire type approach. So we thought we'll look at this because you have various degrees here, these different flare scans from patients where you have very mild changes to more moderate changes to quite severe changes, uh, which you very often can link, as I said, to high blood pressure. Uh, and the interesting thing is with these vascular change, these vascular changes, that a lot of them are reversible by lifestyle changes. And particularly if you read in the literature that dementia, you know, is potentially can reduce the risk of dementia by 30 to 40 percent. Many of these interventions, which are lifestyle based, are targeting the vascular contributions actually to dementia. So that's why it's a really, really important aspect to look at. And if you look in particular at these kind of white matter hyperintensities, they're very often targeted these paraventricular regions, in particular the superior longitudinal fasciculus. 
which of course connects the frontal and parietal regions. And that made us think that especially the procunus and the singular gyrus might be affected by these white matter hyperdensities or the lacunae in these patients. Because as we know, these are kind of hitting this kind of more egocentric framework. So this was our hypothesis. Do actually these potential people with ECI, do they show maybe more egocentric deficits um, and might this be potentially an interesting cognitive market for these people? And that's what we've done. In a very recent paper, again, we used this, this old task we're having in the supermarket. And what you can see is that these, again, these VCI people indeed show really severe deficits on this very, very simple task in which way is the entrance that have really problems with this egocentric translation where things are in space. And uh, I loved, of course, Carsten's talk in terms of, you know, I'm such a big fan of having um, clinically feasible tests. Like our supermarket test, again, takes you 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and you need these tasks for that people use them in the clinics. Otherwise, they're never used. But still, we got a lot of comments all the time that our task is too complex and you need a tablet. So we came up with an even simpler version <laughs> with a paper and pencil, literally, version. And this is what we call a, a kind of a clock analog task. And it is, in this task, uh, we, we tell people, well, we show them a clock face, and then we say, imagine you're standing in the middle of the clock face and you're facing a certain number. Now, can you point to me to number so-and-so? And, -so? and uh, we have different trials, which we go through. So you can make this from quite easy, just a 90 degree to much more complex kind of move, uh, how people need to turn on the clock face just imagining how they turn on the clock face. So it is all in the head. And what you can see is this really pulls these people even further apart. And this test takes you literally five minutes and it's a paper and pencil test. So a very, very basic test, um, which for the clinical people is really great. And it really pulls these VCI people completely apart from both the Alzheimer's and from the control people. And if you do some rock curves, what you can see, so this is the, the distinction between uh, the VCI and Alzheimer's disease. And then you can see this clock test has an area under the curve of 0.9. So pff, it's pretty incredible for a test which takes you less than five minutes. So I think this is, uh, you know, for the future, we will definitely use this much more as a really very quick test to just check these egocentric responses. And I think it would be really interesting to use this as an outcome measure for intervention studies. I think that's Frankly, that's why I think all the, uh, personally, that's where all the spatial tasks will go. So I moved away from the diagnostic side because the blood biomarkers, I think, will sweep everything away. And we will maybe look more at our spatial tests as more uh, outcome measures or functional measures of people's ecological problems, as Carsten also uh, mentioned. So now uh, I'm, I'm going to switch to the agenetic risk kind of people. And I think this is the, um, we talk now about people who have already some changes, but ideally we want to detect these changes much, much earlier. And at genetic risk, you can, of course, look at uh, people like with presenilin, uh, one or two, but they're very rare. And so it's more interesting to me, at least, to look at genetic risk, which is very common in the, in the population. And um, the most common genetic risk factor, of course, for, for dementia is, the, uh, is APOE. And most of you will be very familiar with this, but just for those who are not. Uh, so you have usually you have uh, three types of APOE, two, three, and four, where three, what's called, is the wild type. So it's most common in the population, uh, while uh, APOE4 is basically rarer and APOE2 is even rarer. And APOE4 increases your risk for dementia, APOE2 actually decreases your risk for dementia. And there's also a difference whether you're non-carrier, so APOE3, or whether you're heterozygous, so you have one E3, one E4, or you're homozygous, which means you have two E4. And there you can see your frequency of developing Alzheimer's disease this is just the population frequency it really increases with the heterozygous to the homozygous. You will, it's very, very likely to develop it. And also you develop it much younger, basically. So we looked at APOE for several years now, um, which is a really interesting, uh, you know, you need to look, do a lot of screening, unfortunately, to get a lot of APOE for us. So my students, I used to screen lots of people. Uh, but I think it's a really interesting model to look at. Now, just one thing as well, which I wanted to mention, APOE is, um, 
not necessarily only for Alzheimer's disease, but interestingly enough, ApoE is a really important uh, protein for actually the cholesterol uptake on the blood-brain barrier. So it might be also related to VCI. So this is something which, again, I'm very interested in and we're currently investigating. So this might, again, be this kind of interaction between vascular and Alzheimer's disease changes. So we did, again, uh, in our supermarket house, and what you can see, so these are people who are either the uh, homozygous wild type, so they have just the normal population risk of Alzheimer's disease or dementia, and these are the people at increased risk with one allele because they're more common. I'm not showing here the, the homozygous because, again, they're quite rare. And uh, what you can look at is, for example, at their spatial memory, and they're not different from each other. And um, again, we, we literally throw, uh, in English, they say we throw the kitchen sink at these people. So we test them with any possible memory test. And you won't find any differences between these, these groups. So these are, you know, perfectly fine. And you see some very mild egocentric response deficits. And we've shown this now over several actually tasks that you see these uh, deficits. And then you see also that they have a usually more the, a kind of a central navigation preference, interestingly enough. So this is kind of reverse, which Thomas again talked about. Um, and this really replicates what, of course, Nico Axmacher has shown very nicely in, in his data with the Lucas Kunz uh, publication. But we can show this even with our very simple tasks. So there's no learning involved here. People just navigate this and it's a really kind of simple task. And we have related this as well to function connectivity changes in particular between the, the right intravenous cortex and the um, posterior cingulate and the pecunias and the posterior cingulate. And um, I think this is really just showing that they're already in these people who do not have any atrophy uh, and did not have any one-night hyperintensity, so I should say to this as well, and no, it didn't have high blood pressure, that you can see these very subtle differences already emerging, which we think uh, is really a sign maybe that this might affect them already. But once you go into this kind of preclinical cohorts, it becomes very, very hard actually in terms of variability. The, the effects are so subtle that you need to really have reliable data. And of course, as you, you many of you have heard my previous talks, of course, See Hero Quest is one of our big things we've developed many years ago. I've developed with Hugo Spears at UCL. And this is just data again showing you from our See Hero Quest data. Uh, where we looked at these, again, the Apple E groups, the wild type, the uh, heterozygous E4, and the homozygous E4, in terms of wayfinding performance in this game. And we benchmarked them against this group of 27,000 people, which were all age and education and um, gender matched to these Apple E's. But now in, in CEO Quest, we have even more data. So we have now around 4.3 million people's data. And Unfortunately for this meeting, I didn't have any, any uh, data. We didn't have any data ready, but there's some very exciting stuff we're doing at the moment with, with computational scientists from Oxford, looking actually at individual prediction. So single case prediction, if we can predict people and um, how does this relate as well to biomarkers. So this is really, really exciting stuff, which hopefully by the next years, we, we, uh, in the next year, we will, we will start to publish on this um, as well. So I think I want to now switch a little bit more to this kind of uh, back to the path integration. And one thing we always got as a kind of comment, which I always find very interesting, is that, of course, there's still in these tasks we're using, there is a lot of um, landmarks are in there. And how do people use maybe landmarks in the supermarket? And they could use this landmark to orient themselves. So we started to think maybe we should really um, and you know, classic for path integration, you have really three types of information, the optic flow, the vestibular information, and the proprioception, which in a virtual reality kind of task, if you have a desk-based one, of course, you don't have proprioception. But we thought, how about we take out the optic flow information and really focus much more on these kind of elements? Can we already detect differences, even if people don't have any landmarks or, um, or visual stimuli for this? And this is, of course, leads you into the whole uh, idiothetic kind of navigation, which um, these beautiful data from Talby and colleagues and Mittelstädt and colleagues, where they looked for many years at this, uh, how you move through space, how you use vestibular and proprioception for that, and potentially how you use 
we've heard already a lot about the vestibular kind of input for this in particular, but also from the brainstem in terms of proprioception, how you can potentially use this for your, for your compass localization or speed and acceleration. And for that, um, we developed basically a new uh, an app uh, on, a, on an iPad. And um, this app basically allowed us to, to start to measure this and get really detailed information on, on people's movement through space. And we, we created a, a really simple task, actually, where we had people uh, focus at a, a kind of a, a reference point. And this was usually the door to the room. They, uh, they were not blindfolded at stage, so they knew where the, the, the door was. Then they were blindfolded, had ear, actually had earplugs in, and they basically held the iPad and experimenter was behind the chair. They started the app, and then the app basically told the experimenter how much they needed to turn the chair. This is just an example, of course. And then once they had turned to a certain degree, then the participant had to point with the iPad back to the reference point and think. And during that time, we basically measured this uh, within um, uh, every 10 milliseconds, the accelerometer and gyroscopic information uh, of how much they've moved through space. And we basically had three different, uh, sorry, nine different trials where we either turned people just 90 degrees, so we start very simple, then 90 followed by 220, 120, 300, and so on. So you can see it got more and more complex, basically, that we turned people to make, to challenge them more and more to see how they could find the reference point. Now, this kind of sensor data, so I work a lot with sensor data these days, um, is really beautiful and gives you an enormous amount of data, but it's very noisy, you find it very quickly. So this is, for example, gives you the kind of, just the heading information from the iPad, uh, for, for this kind of a one trial. And you can see there's huge variation as well, how people point to. So we worked together with some computer scientists again, um, who uh, helped us basically clean and normalize the data so that it's all normalized. And uh, then we realized there was so much data in there. So we didn't want to only look at the error people did in terms of degrees, which we could easily measure ourselves. But instead uh, we took like a feature engineering approach where we looked at all the features that were collected during these trials and how they cross-correlated. And from that, we selected the most uh, specific features who were unique. One was end error, which is a kind of sign of a path integration. So, you know, for how far people did diverted from the reference point, but also total angular displacement, tilt, acceleration, jerky behavior and hesitations. Now, uh, again, I can't really go into too much detail what we did, but interesting enough for the end error, which is the path integration, we actually replicated our finding that the, uh, the um, at-risk people were actually slightly worse than the not at-risk, at genetic risk people, which is incredible if you think about it, you know, there's a really simple kind of task. Actually, the participants love this task. They found it absolutely hilarious <laughs> to, to turn them around. So it's a great, you know, in terms of feasibility and acceptability, it's definitely a great task. But this was really the only finding. The rest, if you look at the T statistics, there's very little happening there. There's pretty much nothing is happening there. So this is, tells you as well that looking just at these features in terms of T statistics, the data is too, too subtle for this. So instead, we turned then to machine learning approaches uh, with the computer scientists, looking across all the features actually, and how these features could potentially classify people in at risk and not at risk. And this gives you this kind of F1 score, which is like a standardized score of classification. So the higher the score, uh, the better they, they're classified, uh, basically. Uh, they can classify the at risk from the not at risk. And 0.5 is pretty much a chance. What you can see, there's quite a variation across trials of the task. And uh, there's um, two lines. Uh, in blue, this is the line basically with all the features included. And in red is the line with taking out the end error, so the path integration part, and just looking at the other features. And this gives you just, we looked at three different uh, uh, machine learning algorithms, random forest, uh, subjective su support vector machine learning. And this is a multi-layer uh, perceptron, so this is like a neural network forward um, um, algorithm. 
What's really interesting is you can actually distinguish them, you know, to a certain degree. And the best case is in up to 70 percent, I guess, for certain trials. And that really shows you that even if you take out all the landmarks, all the optic flow information, that these people at genetic risk already are still different from, from not a genetic risk. So There's a really interesting uh, effect. How this is potentially integrated in the interrhinal cortex. We don't know, of course, at the moment where this is. And we don't know whether how much is this proprioception, how much is vestibular. But I think it's a really interesting uh, way of looking at it uh, and really taking out all the optic flow information. Uh, sorry, these are just, again, the trials. And I just want to, to, I guess, in the final part, I just really want to come back to the real world relevance. And for me, this is always a big thing as well, as you all know. Um, how what ecological validity actually has this and in particular if we're going to use these measures as outcome measures or functional measures what does it really relate to um and that's we've done loads of studies in this direction now uh, over time but i just want to highlight you uh you know one i think very recent finding which where we're using a lot of we're using these days we're using a lot of gps sensors and uh, this shows you the town where we live, and uh, this is a healthy control, and you can see their movements over, I think this is over a week, their outdoor movements. And then you can compare this to a patient. Um, so these are now patients, they're not a genetic risk, but these are people who have actually uh, Alzheimer's disease. And you can see the patient lives in this area. Uh, this is the hospital where they came for visit, and this is a shopping center. There's a much less distribution. You can see they're staying as well very locally in their area, so they're always using the same routes. And we all know this from observations. So it's very simple to follow this, but how can you quantify that and how can you relate that? So again, we work with some actually really cool um, um, computational sensor specialists at Cambridge who, where we analyze data of these sensors. And we look really at segments of the trajectories where people go uh, to and analyze those. But as you can see, these are two different segments and real world stuff is very, very messy, of course. But still, you can look at loads of things. And so in previous publications, I'm not going into this, we looked at all kind of the environment, the road network or road network entropy and how this impacts on patients, for example, getting lost. Um, but for this one, we actually looked more, can we actually classify patients, whether they go out alone or whether they're accompanied? Because we know that once they're accompanied, they behave like pretty much like anyone because they just follow someone very often. But if they go out alone, they actually behave very differently. And that will allow you in the future, what we're planning to do is can we develop algorithms for predictive warning signs that somebody is potentially, potentially getting lost. And I just wanted to show you where we're looking for example, it features what like something like segment complexity. And this is really just a measure of how similar the routes are they're going uh, and the total turning angle, which is whether they make more erratic turning points, uh, turns, which we think is a sign of disorientation. And you get these very nice feature, you know, features and classification accuracies where we run these algorithms across and you can get this segment complexity and total turning angle. You can actually classify someone just from their traces, what you know, whether they are a patient, but not only that, whether they're a patient or whether they're accompanied by somebody else. And this is uh, really, I think, the sensors, especially the passive sensors, I think that we're doing a lot of work in this direction, um, which I think is really exciting and how this relates then to the spatial navigation uh, aspects, which clearly have this real world uh, impact for that. Take home messages, so path integration processes are impaired in clinical Alzheimer's disease, differentiated from other dementias. Vascular cognitive impairment contributes to egocentric orientation changes in path integration. So I think this is really interesting and we don't know how much this might contribute to the Alzheimer because some of them will have vascular changes. A genetic risk carries demonstrated reliable but subtle path integration changes related to these enterine posterior singular changes. And at genetic risk carriers show uh, idiothetic changes which might contribute to path integration deficits. And basically, these are all impact real world navigation, which we, it's still so uh, less understood, I guess. And just to say thank you to Bundes and a very shameless advertisement for my book I've just recently published. So if you want to have a look at this, uh, this is more written for lay people, but it goes also into the history of the disease. Um, and that's all. Thank you.
Great, fantastic talk, Michael. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It was definitely worth in inviting you a third time. Try <laughs> <laughs> no, oh. <laughs> Yeah, dear. <laughs> so here's a question from Aaron Wilber. Your and other human work always make me wonder if we are doing a poor job of asking questions about egocentric deficits and AD rodent models. <clears throat> However, I also wonder if the egocentric deficits in the supermarket task might actually might actually the center to egocentric yeah, information yeah, deficits. Yeah. Yes, I, I completely agree. And when we designed it, we didn't think about it. I completely agree with you, Aaron. This is much more. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, we, we called uh, in the paper, we called it lost in spatial translation. Exactly that. Because it's much more retrosplenia. Mm -hmm. So I completely, I completely agree with that statement. So it's not a pure egocentric task. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um... So don't see any other questions popping up yet. So maybe a quick, more practical question. So you, and I think also Carsten, uh, mentioned that yeah, it's always difficult to get these tasks into clinical settings because clinicians want to see like what quick and easy and whatnot. Is that, is that really such a big issue? Because uh, I've been, as you might know, I've been involved in a more like psychiatric oriented project where we develop VR for like therapy of like anxiety disorders. And our experience was, yes, initially clinicians can be quite hesitant, but then when they really see the benefit in terms of additional information it gives them in terms of the additional treatment options they have, they are actually, they, they start being very open. And then they also are happy to then say, okay, it's something that's technically more involved. It's something that might take a bit longer than my usual, but I also see the benefit. So do you really think it's, it's such a big problem? I, I, yeah, I, I still think it's a big problem, but I agree with the buy-in comes when people see actually the benefits of this, then I think people get really convinced of this. But if you want to scale it up, it gets very hard. So if you go to a tertiary center, like a university hospital, you can convince people. But if you go to a smaller hospital <clears throat> or to GPs or anything like this, it's very, very hard to convince anybody. Or in a small community hospital, they will just say, we don't have the resources, we don't have the time. And so it's very hard to convince them. And even if you say to them, or oh, just give them the tablet in the waiting room, uh, you know, while they're waiting. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done. So it needs to be fairly quick and reliable and very, you know, not intrusive at all. I think people are really always stretched, I think. So there's a big difference between the university hospital settings and, and smaller communities. And for me, that's, I think, more rolling it out across, I guess, and Carsten mentioned this as well, the remote monitoring aspect is clearly something which becomes much more relevant now, but then who's checking the results and how would people check the results is a, a really kind of interesting aspect. That's why I think we went more down than the sensor route, uh, which I think is really more interesting in terms of really measuring than ecological behavior. But um, I always say to the experimentalists who have lovely tasks, I think you always have to think how, how, how many confounds do you, do you allow yourself to enter? And it's still a clinically valid task because all our tasks are confounded. But if we're getting still the same effects and they're reliable, it doesn't matter for clinical purposes. Okay, I'm sorry, I see there are two more questions, but we have to really move on. So maybe you can uh, try to uh, catch Michael on Gather like after the session, because we also have a fourth speaker. Sure, so that's again, no, I want to take. And um, Ineke, Ineke van der Haan from Leiden University is the, has the honor to be the final speaker in this session and in the conference. So thank you very much, Ineke. And um, we're looking forward to your talk. So please share your slides. Thank you very much. Let me try and share. I hope this is, yes. this is working. Yeah. Sure. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to thank you for inviting me here for this lovely, very interesting conference. I've uh, really enjoyed myself over the last three days. Uh, and I'm quite happy that I can share some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and uh, I titled it Navigation Performance Across the Lifespan, and uh, I would like to pay specific attention to uh, self-efficacy beliefs and stereotyping as a potential uh, impact on performance. Um, so in my group, we focus a lot on getting lost and um, sort of regardless of the cause. So we, we focus a lot on uh, people uh, affected by um, acquired brain injury. So there's a really sudden onset of navigation complaints. And we, we try to diagnose this and try to uh, help out um, with the treatment. 
Um, we've also uh, worked with people who um, have problems getting lost um, from birth onwards um, and also gradually with older age. So all these uh, groups are, are incorporated in, a, in our work. And uh, thinking about navigation impairment, we started working on this uh, about 12 years ago. And this really started uh, with something that uh, Karsten has also um, linked to, that people report the complaints, but actually in our clinical toolkit, we have nothing to really deal with this. We have the Ray complex figure, we have other very limited tabletop tasks that really don't address the complexity of navigation com uh, impairment in the real world. Um, and that was something we observed and decided to start working on. Um, because if we address, uh, work with these people with the complaints and we use dedicated experimental tasks, we can really show highly specific impairments. So I would like to see our work as very much um, going from clinical practice to, um, to theory. Um, and that this is an interaction. So a lot of our input comes from um, the requests and needs from the clinical field. And we try to work with that from our theoretical perspective. So really an evidence-based approach. Um, so first of all, we started uh, to um, look in the field and look how, how big is this issue of navigation impairment after uh, acquired brain injury. And we devised a questionnaire, which has been changed over the years um, a bit and now has a final version of 22 questions that cover navigation and orientation, distance estimation, and spatial anxiety, because we see in these uh, patients, anxiety levels are really, really highly relevant um, and often linked to navigation performance. Uh, and we found this to be a reliable tool. It's freely available in Dutch and English, and there is a French and Turkish version at the moment as well. Um, and we found that this is valid and clinically useful, especially for stroke patients. Um, and we are now in the process of, of uh, we've just submitted um, an elaborate normative data set for this, taking into account age and gender, as these factors are quite um, impactful on, um, on scores on this questionnaire. And um, so putting this topic, and I guess uh, that sort of makes sense at the end of this conference where we started out um, quite fundamental and now we are, this is a very practical approach. If we put this in a neuropsychological context, there is just a really strong need for meaningful clinical material um, that is accepted also by the clinical um, um, environment. Um, and what I've learned from, with my interactions from people in the clinical field is that they really would like something that reflects the self-reported complaints, because most of the times that is a starting point, that a patient or person um, reports navigation impairment themselves. And um, so the, the way finding questionnaire is the first entry to, to, um, to look into that. Um, and we've went into the literature uh, looking at individual case reports because often these are um, described very elaborately. And um, uh, a few years ago, we found uh, a total of 67 individual case descriptions um, that looked into the question, if the navigation uh, performance becomes problematic, what are the characteristics of the, um, of the problems? And we figured out there were three main domains to which the um, impairment uh, patterns could be assigned. Um, and this is something that looks like this. First of all, we have people who had really problems in the identification of landmarks during navigation people with problems with static spatial information or, or locations. And you can do this with regard to the self, of course, egocentrically or with regard to the environment, allocentrically. So within the patients described, there were some that were more egocentrically impaired and others that were more allocentrically impaired. And um, there was a group of individuals who had specific problems with uh, paths or spatial relations between different locations or the question, how do I get there? And here we also found a dissociation between, between people who had problems with dynamic information. So how do I get from A to B in a step-by-step -step fashion or people who had uh, problems just referencing two or more locations to one another. And um, 
uh, sort of uh, going from there, we also were interested to see how aging was uh, reflected in literature at a behavioral level. So we looked into literature with behavioral measures of navigation, taking into account this subdivision of different cognitive domains that we uh, established. And we found 39 studies that did one or more behavioral measure of navigation in relation to age. Um, and we did this to sort of get a, get a feel of what was uh, presently available. Also because uh, obviously many studies focus on one element or two very specific elements of navigation and not the uh, navigation ability in its entirety. Um, one observation that we made is when we looked at the age ranges used, so we had 39 papers, and actually eight of them did not report specific details about the ages included, which was remarkable, I thought. Um, but for the 31, this is um, the frequency uh, um, depiction of which ages were included. And obviously, as you can see, a lot of the papers only focus on a very young group versus a group of 65 to 75. But there's this in, yeah, um, very interesting group in between and also at an older age that might also be worthwhile to uh, look further into. And when we looked at the tasks that were typically used, um, you can see this here, I hope it's not too small, that we see um, for each um, domain, as we determined it, um, the total number of studies that included it out of the 39, and the total number that showed decrease, and um, the number of studies that showed stability. We see that the majority of the studies focus on the path information, so with two or multiple locations, and, and there we find a convincing um, pattern of a decrease with age especially in the, in the majority of studies that have uh, just a very young and a very old group. So in uh, taking this into account that we have the multiple domains and that it would be interesting to cover uh, a, a larger age line, so have more ages included, maybe just the entire lifespan, and also to, to incorporate the domains, as I mentioned. We did the uh, Leiden navigation test, which was an online um, experiment, uh, not nearly the size as a Sea Hero Quest, um, but we had in total 12,000 um, Dutch participants, um, ranging in the age from eight to 100. Um, and sadly, this video, it wasn't working before. I think it won't be active. <clears throat> this will show you um, slowly going through the environment. As you can see here, this is the map of the environment. You would go slowly through it at each intersection. You would meet um, a clear landmark that was distinct in color from the background. And we would ask different questions per domain. So first of all, we would ask, did you see this landmark? As, um, as a landmark question. For the location um, questions, we ask uh, this one. So can you place the item on a map or not? They hadn't seen the map before at that time. And for the egocentric location, we asked if you are at this particular point in the environment, can you point to the end point of the route? And there would be a, a spaceship at the end that was part of the narrative of the experiment. You're landed on um, an alien planet and you need to find your spaceship to go back home. So there was some relevance uh, to the end point of the route. And people there in this question could select one out of six arrows pointing to the end point of the route. <clears throat> and then we had the, um, the dy dynamic path question where we would ask, if you see this image, where did you continue left or right or straight ahead? And lastly, we would ask them about the arrangement of the different uh, landmarks. So we would present them with three landmarks and say, which of the two are closest together if you would use a top view? So this way we had an experiment that lasted um, not more than eight minutes um, uh, and that uh, that would really measure all the different domains with a very large uh, sample. And just to show you briefly what we found per domain, um, what was interesting is that the aging pattern, if you uh, spread it out over different age groups and also for female and male participants is that the aging pattern differs per domain that we, we saw. So landmark performance is actually quite good, starts out at 90%. Um, I only have the adults here for clarity. Um, 
And still for the older individuals, we st they're above 80%. So this is going quite well. For the egocentric location task, so they were pointing to the end point of the route, we see that there's a um, performance is not very high. It's a difficult task, but it's still well above chance level. Um, that there is an immediate decline at early age, but then there's a lot of stability. So it's in this case, it's very interesting to, to include all the different age ranges to see what's going on. And then the allocentric location task where people were um, invited to um, put the landmark on the map. We see a stronger linear decrease with age, a minor male advantage for some of the age groups. And um, then the fourth task was the, um, the root task. So did I go left, did I go right or straight ahead? And we see um, a minor male advantage here and it's sort of a, a more of a curved uh, decline with age. And lastly, <clears throat> the one that's mostly uh, distinct from the others, where we actually see an improvement in performance. And this is the one where they had three images and they had to pick the two that were closest together. And we sort of, um, it, it might be possible th that these groups, the 50s and, and 60 year olds were the individuals who would use still in their, in their youth um, the paper maps in the car or look up information or write it down and not be so reliant on GPS systems as, as the younger generations may be. But this is an assumption and we don't have the uh, longitudinal data for, to uh, verify this. Um, <clears throat> so the clinical goals with this, um, this type of test is that we can address navigation complaints because it, clinically that, that's where it starts. Someone comes up to their um, healthcare provider and says, okay, I have problems finding my way around. And uh, we've just submitted uh, a paper concerning this, what this procedure would look like. So the diagnostic procedure would start with assessment. Are there navigation complaints? If they are not there, then we do not recommend to perform diagnostics. Um, and this is the clinical viewpoint, of course, as long as the patient themselves does not perceive a problem, then there's no need to fix it. If uh, they do perceive um, a problem, then we would advise to first start with the wayfinding questionnaire to see if relative to their peers, are, are their ex experiences um, at an impaired level or not. And it could also be with older age that their perception of their performance is a bit lower, but that this is still within the normal range, for instance. Um, but if they score at an impaired level at the wayfinding questionnaire, so the, which is also quite easy to administer, of course, and we're, uh, that was just discussed before, huh? that this should be something that it's easily accepted by the clinical domain and shouldn't take too much uh, time or difficult resources. So then uh, as a third step, we would recommend doing um, our brief uh, navigation test, which can be performed uh, online or as a tablet, like the examples before, and would take uh, several minutes to perform. And in case someone also shows impairment on that level, then we would recommend um, uh, looking at cognitive rehabilitation uh, methods for this particular patient. And apart from performing a diagnostic procedure with the end goal of performing um, uh, rehabilitation, it could also be screening um, an early marker, which has also been mentioned in these, uh, these uh, um, past days. Um, then you could consider going immediately to this objective screening because you can, you can think about what the complaint itself would do. So it has a different function in that uh, setting. It can also be part of a, just a general population screening to see how people are doing. Uh, there's something that we're working on with the uh, University Hospital in Leiden that you can, in the rehabilitation department, that you check up on people physically, cognitively, and this could be a task that can be um, informative in that sense. Um, and we're also uh, implementing the, the Leiden navigation test with the Free University in Amsterdam at their Alzheimer's Center. It's being implemented now in their standard diagnostic procedure for all incoming patients. And they're repeating it um, after one year to also see how it progresses. So we're waiting on the data uh, of that to come in. So that's uh, an exciting uh, wait. And I hope to know more about this soon. Um, and 
I would like to zoom in now on this self-report, uh, the, the complaints, the, that element, the subjective element in this uh, procedure. Because what we did in the Leiden navigation task, uh, the, the large uh, skill task, we also asked people just one simple question, how well do you think your navigation skills are? And here we see a very clear pattern um, that is affected by both gender and age. So as you can see in this graph, um, we standardized objective performance and we standardized subjective performance within this group. And here we see that um, the most underestimation, so the highest score um, is, is visible in the young females and the strongest overestimation is found in the oldest males. Um, and this is something I think to consider um, and also a key element in this diagnostic procedure. So at the moment, someone comes up to you says, um, I have problems doing this. It, apparently it matters what gender and what age group this uh, person belongs to um, as the experienced impairment is such a leading factor in all these clinical procedures. Um, and what it also did for us is that it raised the question of, of um, how do people come to this decision? Or do they have, um, apparently they don't really have a good uh, impression of their own performance, but what are they doing? Are they looking at their former self maybe for the older individual? So what reference frame do they use? Or um, do they rely on stereotypes um, in making this decision? So we decided to explore that uh, a bit more in this context. And what we did is we reached out to uh, 980 Dutch respondents and we asked them about stereotypes concerning gender as well as age. And we just asked them with regard for spatial abilities on the one hand and navigation on the other, um, if you have a skill going from male to female or from young to old, where do you think, who do you think is better in general? So it was a skill looking like this, males on the left end and females on the right end. And concerning spatial ability, what do you think? Same for navigation. These were the scores. So people were strongly in favor of a male advantage for spatial ability in general. We, just, we decided to split this up and describe spatial ability as small scale uh, spatial skills. Um, in Dutch, this would also be termed spatial insight. And this is something that uh, is, is quite different from large scale navigation. So we decided to split that up and be very explicit in the questionnaire with examples and elaborate description about what we me meant by these terms. And for navigation, we see a highly similar, I think it was 37% and 39% for the, for the males and females. And then for age, we saw something a little bit different. So we see young on the left end and old on the right end. And we see that people think that younger individuals are, are clearly better at spatial ability, but for navigation, they were nearly at 50.0 um, score. So that did not have any stereotype for people. Um, so even in the uh, object, uh, subjective evaluation of the concept of small scale spatial abilities and large scale spatial abilities, people did dissociate in terms of, um, of age. And to split this out, because it's quite interesting to see how this differs for gender group and age group. So what you see here are the different age groups, the different gender groups. And on the left end here, you see how they evaluated a gender and age in a general level, so as a stereotype. And on the right end, this is how they evaluate it themselves. And you see, especially for gender, people are quite strong in saying there is a uh, male advantage, low means uh, to the male end uh, and towards the young end. And we see in these self evaluations, people are in generally evaluating themselves to the right end, to the better end of the scale. And in this top graph shows you for spatial ability and the same thing um, I'm sorry, highlighted here for the, for the age in particular, to show you that only the younger individuals show this stereotype of age, saying that younger, so themselves are, um, are better at spatial ability. And we see that the older individuals uh, do not hold a stereotype like this at all. 
And in terms of their own evalu evaluation, we see that quite strongly, except for this one particular female group, uh, people evaluate themselves to be above average in relation to their own age group. For navigation ability, we see a somewhat different pattern um, as we saw before. And here, um, only the males uh, in the 46 to 6 year old group say um, that they see an, an, um, an age-related stereotype even favoring the older individuals. Whereas for the age group, this is quite similar to what we see here, only the younger females do not hold, uh, do not evaluate themselves as highly. So this is again, the underestimation in the younger population going on for the, for the females. So what we see here actually is that uh, the gender stereotype is much stronger, but there is an age-related stereotype specifically for spatial ability, but not so much for navigation. Um, so self-reported performance and stereotype beliefs are different across age and gender. So that's really important to take this into account again in this diagnostic procedure. When people come up to you, if, what gender is, um, do they have? What age group do they belong to? And we see that self-reported performance, the stereotype beliefs show different patterns from objective performance. And also it's important to be very clear about the cognitive construct you're interested in. Is it small scale spatial ability or large scale? Um, and I guess also quite important to let people know what you're looking for. Are, um, are they complaining about how they're performing now in um, relation to their old self? Or are they reporting problems in relation to peers? And are those gender, gender uh, um, peers in terms of gender or peers in terms of age group or both? Um, these are all quite interesting things to, to keep in mind in this um, when, when asking about self-reports. Um, and we went a bit further with this. So we, um, this was a group that we just questioned online and um, a smaller group, we, we got to the lab and we did the landing navigation tap, uh, test in a lab setting supervised. And we combined that with stereotype beliefs. And we had a group of young individuals and a group of older individuals, male and female. And overall, we just sort of explored the data and we saw that there were no significant correlations between objective performance, subjective performance and stereotype beliefs. But when we started to split up the group, we saw that the young adults did show um, um, a relation between their self-estimation and objective performance. So they were, they tended to be a bit better in assessing how well they did. But the older adults showed uh, a link between stereotype belief and self estimation. So actually the people who hold stronger stereotype beliefs of favoring older individuals were also the ones who evaluated their own performance better. So there is a, a relevant uh, informative link. For gender, we saw that uh, the males held no relation between objective subjective performance or stereotype beliefs. But for the females, we saw a similar pattern as for the older individuals. Those who thought that um, there was a, a female favoring stereotype or a less male favoring stereotype also evaluated themselves better. So a direct relation between objective performance and stereotypes seems limited, but there are patterns between stereotype beliefs and these self-estimation, self-efficacy beliefs, uh, especially for older and female individuals. And uh, we decided to go a bit further with, with this to see if we can manipulate this. And we did this only with the gender because there the, the stereotype was a bit stronger. And we used uh, fictitious scientific evidence, which of course we are neatly debriefed after. We uh, came up with graphs that would either favor their own gender on the task or disadvantage their own uh, performance on the task or would nullify any gender effect. And we were just very interested in how this would affect people. If you see this before you do such a spatial task, what would happen? Um, and actually nothing would happen to the objective performance. We see a slight tendency for the nullified information to be a bit lower, but this was not significant. So what we see here is that males 
were performing a bit higher in both the positive and negative condition, and the females were performing lower in also both the positive and negative condition. Is there another way that such an, a manipulation um, could impact uh, individuals? And it's, um, I think this is a, is a good um, sort of way of, of imposing a stereotype that might be a societal stereotype for the individuals, but here we actively presented it to them in the lab setting. What was interesting is that we also asked them about how what the, what the information did to them. We asked them, how did the information make you feel going from bad to good? And we see that the male group um, was really not affected in terms of feeling, whereas there was a significant change in how well they felt um, about the information uh, for the female group. But in contrast, when we look at the male, male groups and we ask, we look at the rational question, so did you agree with the information or here, did you believe the information? Then we see, especially here with the agreement, a, a male effect, whereas the females were not responding uh, differently to this question at all. And here's a tendency trend level effect for uh, males to believe the positive manipulation a bit more. So what does this tell us? So there, there is an overestimation that comes with older age. We see this in particular for, for male participants. So this is something to consider in this diagnostic cycle of first starting with the self-evaluation um, because we have such a strong reliance on self-reports. So it is good to consider the individual differences and also to reflect on how well people actually understand the cognitive constructs uh, we're looking for um, in their descriptions. Um, and we see that self-reports are, are distinctly separate from stereotype beliefs. Um, and that's even much more, much stronger for gender than for age. And there is a direct relation between uh, stereotypes and performance limited for the objective performance, but for the subjective um, uh, performance, we do see a connection, especially for the older and female groups, which are the groups that are typically uh, disadvantaged by the stereotypes. Um, and stereotype input, whether it would be it, it's interesting to consider if this would also relate to uh, societal stereotype input. Um, it's perceived differently by the um, by different individuals. Females have a more emotional response, whereas males seem to dis um, um, have a more rational distinction in positive and negative impact. Um, and to conclude, I would just like to mention the future work we're working on, the Leiden navigation test is freely available and we're, we're working on clinical dissemination with our partners in Alzheimer's Center, but also in uh, nurse, neuropsychological clinics to see, um, to implement this further. And we're also working on adjusted versions of this test. Um, to elaborate um, our, our findings there. We're looking into effects of emotional valence of different landmarks, uh, measures of mood of the participants, and also developmental focus. In, in, for the younger group, what do we see there? And I was very interested to, to hear about uh, Karsten's work because we're also considering uh, doing this task with neuroimaging in the MS patients to explore that further. And in response to diagnostics, we are, um, we have just finished our work on the landing navigation training, where people receive personalized training exercises in virtual environments, which uh, yield quite good results in both healthy individuals and people with acquired brain injury. And I would like to finish here by thanking uh, the people who did most of the work, Michiel, Milan, and Anna, and also other people involved in this work. And thank you for, uh, for listening. Okay, great. Thank you, Inika, for this very comprehensive overview of your work. So we have uh, two questions here from the audience. Um, first one, do you think that increased technological skills, for example, navigating with Google Maps or navigation systems, uh, could influence the estimation of young old stereotypes? Um, so if the um, increased technological skills um, could influence the estimation, 
Hmm, that's an interesting question. So um, I, I do hear, and over the years I've heard this a lot, that people assume that older individuals are no, not very good at doing this. But I wonder if this question is about the, the person holding the stereotype, if they have more skills. But I think uh, and, and that's also something we're showing in our work uh, and in a lot of work that the older individuals are getting increasingly better at working with, uh, with GPS systems. So I, th yeah, I would assume, especially... I, I think this would would disappear at at, at this point. And a related question also from Christoph Koch: uh, In the future, could the frequent use of technological tools, so for example, navigation apps, uh, act towards compensating deficits and change who might search for help and who does not? Oh, for sure. I th I think this is a very relevant point, and I think not for all cases, and especially uh, for the people where we. Um, uh, we look at um, uh, with the developmental issues and we really have developmental topographical disorientation. They are not helped uh, often by the GPS systems, but I think a lot of the people who are not in the, the, the extreme impaired level, but are sort of in the gray area or even just in a healthy population who say, oh, I just have difficulty doing this. I think a lot of that can be fixed uh, by relying on those uh, technological tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I see that Jan also has raised his hand. Jan? Oh, hello. Thank you for a very nice, interesting talk. And you just uh, wondering, uh, uh, do you plan to use uh, your task or any modification task in a participant with uh, Alzheimer's disease, or this is not really your, your focus? Yeah, we are, we are now doing this. We started doing this to have a sort of a healthy uh, reference for our um, uh, people with acquired brain injury, but we're now wor working with the people in Amsterdam to see if this has predictive value. Um, and, and so we have data from people who started, who, who came into the diagnostic procedure at the Alzheimer's Center because they had complaints and they go through the, a very elaborate diagnostic procedure and our task was included there. And uh, these people are now seen for the second time after a year and some even, even after two years. So we're hoping to finish that soon to explore um, whether it can be useful in that context as well. Oh, thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions from the panel? No, doesn't look like it. Okay, then thank you again, Ika. And um, no. that's it. Um, Motohara and I wanted to say a couple of words in the end. Let me just see what I can share my screen as well. Can you see that? Anyone see that? Yep. Okay, perfect. So that's it. This was iScan 2021. Um, so we hope that you enjoyed the conference, um, despite its, its virtual format. Um, we want to take the opportunity again to uh, thank, in particular, our backstage crew um, and also Annette Kirmes and Sandra Littmann, who really made things go so smoothly. And um, it was actually, it still is a lot of work to set up these kind of virtual meetings. A lot of stuff need to be organized. That you don't need to care about in a, in a real conference. So without them, we wouldn't have been able to, to pull this off. Um, what's interesting uh, is that, um, I mean, when we started iScan uh, in 2016, I think it's something like 50 or 60 uh, people attending the conference. It was like a small, cozy meeting. I think the second one was a bit bigger. It was more like 70 to 80. But now uh, with online format, obviously, it's much easier for people to attend. And these are numbers from uh, last night, uh, where we, were, we had like almost 190 people who registered for the meeting. And there was a maximum of concurrent viewers of like 93 people. So this is obviously, obviously great, um, because it <coughs> allows you to get more, more attention and, and uh, spread the word more widely. So thanks to everyone for tuning in, for contributing to the discussions, and for uh, making this a very exciting meeting. Um, yeah, what's next? Um, so we do plan to put some of the talks, so those, those of you, so those of the speakers who consented 
to have their talks recorded. Um, we we hope we can would be able to put them online so that in case you missed the talk, um, you will be able to to see it and then view it later. Uh, we haven't decided on a platform yet, but we'll email the link to, to everyone. Um, if you have any ideas or feedback on how to improve uh, for future iScan meetings, please let us know. Uh, we're not going to do any kind of formal survey, but you know the email address, iscan at dzne.de, which will remain open. So if you have any ideas on how, what, how to further develop the meeting or maybe additional topics to cover, um, just let us know and we'd be very happy to consider this. Um, yeah, so we don't know what's going to come in the future, in the near and the far future. <laughs> we hope to be able to do another meeting in 2023. Um, it was definitely the right decision to have this meeting as an online meeting because just this morning, actually, uh, the conference room in the DZNE where we used to hold the meeting uh, has been turned into a COVID test center for participants mm -hmm. because every participant who comes into the DZNE even if they're vaccinated or recovered, have to get tested now for COVID. So the whole room is now a COVID test center. Um, but we hope, of course, that in 2023, uh, everything will be uh, more relaxed and uh, hopefully we can have an in-person meeting again. But in the meantime, we want all of you to stay healthy and do keep doing the great research you've all been doing. And um, with that, I'd say goodbye. Uh, I don't know, Motohari, did you want to say any final words? Yes, I will uh, talk a little bit. So yeah, as a co-organizer, I also uh, thank you very much for all the participants for this iScan 2021. And uh, I think I myself enjoyed a lot and I hope it was the same for everyone. Um, I'm very happy with all the uh, speakers and uh, yeah, I thought there's a very good balance of repeated speakers and the new speakers as well. You know, one of our uh, goal is to mix, uh, in facilitate interactions between animal researchers and uh, human researchers. I think uh, this year was was very nice in that respect. So I'm happy with that. As Thomas already mentioned, uh, any feedback to us would be very good because uh, we're going to be motivated to um, make it better for the next time. I already heard some some uh, feedbacks, for example, like uh, some people are already uh, definitely missing the uh, going out after the after the talks. And that's definitely true, because when I think about the last two meetings, you know, going out with the speakers and chatting was always good. But uh, I also have heard some um, comments like, yeah, it was actually great waking up in our apartment, in my apartment, and you know, eating breakfast and uh, listening listening to uh, great talks. You know, so there were definitely um, positive parts also, and I hope people felt this way and uh, had a unique uh, experience uh, with uh, including this gather space. So yeah, I hope and you 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 all enjoyed like I did, and uh, I hope to see you hopefully in two years in person. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Well then, bye-bye everyone. Have a good day, good night, wherever you are, and see you soon. Oh yeah, the gather will be still open. So yes. people who want to especially uh, ask more questions to uh, some of the speakers from, ex especially from this session, it is, it is still possible. Yeah, perfect, yeah. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.